The next speaker is uh, a specialist in uh, lameness. He's coming uh, from US. He's associate director of the Arkansas University. So please uh, welcome uh, Professor Whiteman, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is a picture of the Center for Excellence for Poultry Science uh, at the University of Arkansas. This is uh, 22 years old, but it's still the best uh, research teaching facility on the campus. So we're in the middle of the poultry industry and we're very appreciative of uh, their contributions and support. And uh, it's interesting to be talking about lameness in terms of gut integrity. How can we link gut health, gut integrity to something like osteomyelitis, which is a bacterial infection of the bone, and lameness? So I'm gonna try to talk a little bit about the pathogenesis of this lameness problem and then towards the end, we're gonna link this to gut health. Um, initially, we have to admit that uh, this problem is a metabolic disease, and that means that uh, modern broilers are growing extremely rapidly. We basically start with a 40-gram chick at one day of age, and at eight weeks of age, we can end up with a four-kilogram chick. So this is a very dramatic uh, rate of growth. Uh, six to seven uh, uh, body weight doublings in that eight-week period. And if you just look at the size of a baby chick and the size of an eight-week-old broiler, you understand that there's complete molecular reorganization. The skeleton has to undergo tremendous growth, and that's going to be a major feature of this fast growth uh, syndrome. So along with these uh, fast growth uh, processes, we inherit some metabolic diseases, which include heart, heart attacks, uh, sudden death syndrome, ascites syndrome, and uh, lameness. Uh, over the years, a number of investigators have published papers speculating that basically leg weakness in commercial broilers is, selection, is due to their uh, selection for a very rapid increase in body weight and that uh, applies an abnormally high load or weight on structurally immature bones. So we need to talk a little bit about bone growth in order to figure out uh, the pathogenesis of this problem. And we're going to narrow this down. There are about 14 different types of lameness. So when you came to Munich to hear a truly lame presentation, uh, that lame presentation is going to focus on one type. Um, Previously, this was called femoral head necrosis, and you, you probably know it by that terminology, but it's been retitled uh, bacterial chondronecrosis with osteomyelitis. And that means a bacterial cause of the death of the cartilage cells in the growth plate, and osteomyelitis simply means a bacterial infection. And uh, this terminology was proposed about uh, 14 years ago, because this syndrome not only includes the femoral head, but also the tibial head, the proximal tibial head, and also the flexible thoracic vertebrae. And I'll show you uh, how those uh, come into play here in a minute. So the highest incidences of this are seen in fastest growing flocks, and one of the treatments to prevent it is to slow down growth. Uh, but that basically compromises uh, uh, the time of the flock in the house as well as uh, feed efficiency. Uh, this is the most co currently the most common cause of lameness in the United States. Uh, we generally assume that about 1.5% of all broilers grown to yield weights will succumb to this, and yield weights would be after six weeks of age. We typically won't see this before about day 35 in the field. But that's a number that ought to get your attention if you're familiar with the large number of birds that, that are grown. Sometimes we get into epidemic situations and we'll lose a third of a flock. So that's a very impressive loss. And uh, this actually turns out to be convenient because now we can put an economic impact on a problem that primarily is due to a failure of gut integrity. So this gives us a wedge, if you will, to, to try out uh, means to improve gut integrity and thereby reduce this, this problem. You see these early symptoms, these birds are wingtip dipping. They're using that wing to support the leg that has a subclinical lesion in it. And then eventually they'll go down and be immobilized. You also see in this, this picture the wire flooring model that we're using. Notice how it bows in between these wooden supports. And we use this model to trigger a high incidence of this problem so that we can study it experimentally and use it as a test bed. 
Okay, so where do we see these lesions? Um, many of you are familiar with uh, what's called uh, kinky back. It's basically uh, been known in turkeys and broilers uh, since the 1950s as spondylitis or spondylopathy. But basically, it's a bacterial infection of this flexible vertebrae here. And this turns out to be the pivot point between the fused vertebrae anterior to it, called the notarium, uh, which supports the weight of all the breast muscle, and then the sensacrum, the fused uh, pelvis in the back of the bird, which supports all the weight of the, the legs. So this one flexible vertebrae, the proximal and, and distal uh, growth plates, undergo a lot of uh, shear stress and torque as this bird is moving, standing, and walking. And what we end up with is uh, infection, bacterial infection of the vertebral body. You see the, the vertebral body is, is uh, swollen. And then when you cut through it, you can see a bacterial abscess here. And then ultimately, this abscess and swelling compresses the spinal cord, and the birds uh, display a distinctive kinky back or hawk resting posture bilaterally. So this is part of the syndrome. Uh, we also typically see this in the proximal head of the femur. Uh, here we're looking at typical femoral head necrosis lesions, um, and this is probably what you're familiar with. And we'll see similar lesions if you don't see the cause of the lameness in the T4 vertebrae or the proximal head of the femur, then cut the proximal head of the tibia and you'll see similar uh, necrotic type lesions, dissolution of the support struts, struts of uh, uh, metaphyseal bone here, and bacterial colonization of the growth plate. Here's a bacterial abscess in the secondary center of, of calcification. So the proximal ends of the bones. Um, typically, if we cut the distal ends of the bones, we can rarely find a lesion, but not, not typically. So we typically are going to see proximal ends of these long bones of the legs affected in addition to the flexible thoracic vertebrae. So why are the proximal growth plates primarily affected? And this gets into the underlying pathogenesis that's related to fast growth. Um, most of you, if you thought about bone, you think of it as a relatively inert material. You think of it as concrete. It's just support, maybe structural steel. Uh, that would support the bird. But when you think about this in terms of a, a newly hatched 40-gram chick and an eight-week-old broiler, what you can see is that this bone undergoes dramatic change, both in length and diameter. Uh, it's dissolved from the inside and added to from the outside to increase its diameter fourfold during that eight weeks. And then growth plates at either end of the bone cause the elongation. And so it's going to elongate sevenfold uh, during those eight weeks. And that growth plate has to be supplied with, with blood. And you would think of the bone as probably being avascular or not, not well vascularized, but it's actually highly vascular. Uh, there's, there's a huge uh, role of blood flow to support the maturation and elongation of the growth plate both from the metaphyseal or, or inner side and also from the epiphyseal or outer side of the growth plate. So we have a very metabolically active tissue, uh, internal blood supply following the growth plates, and complete molecular reorganization. By the time this bird gets to be eight weeks of age, there's nothing left of the original bone that the baby chick started with. So very dynamic uh, tissue remodeling here. Um, when we look at the growth plate, uh, we can see a complicated arrangement of cells. Basically, here's the white cap of articular cartilage that you're used to seeing, the epiphysis. Uh, right next to that, there's a resting zone. These are basically stem cells that undergo cell division and then cell swelling. So the rate at which this growth plate is going to elongate the bone and grow the bird depends upon the rate of mitosis here or cell division and the rate of cell swelling. And so what numerous people have discovered is that the thickness of this growth plate is directly proportional to the growth rate of the bird. So the faster the bird is growing, um, the thicker the growth plate tends to be. And a number of investigators, here you see uh, a list of names, have uh, indicated that 
When these growth plates get ver very thick, these are just cartilage cells. They're unsupported, they're poorly organized, and they're relatively weak. And when you put a lot of weight uh, bearing down on that cartilage, it's subject to microfracturing and cleft formation. So fast growth gives you a, a very thick growth plate, and then those thick growth plates are subjected to microtrauma and shear stress. Uh, how does that relate to the proximal end of the growth plate? Well, this experiment was actually first conducted in 1725 uh, in a one-bird experiment and then replicated in 1964 by Church and Johnson, who basically put a mark at mid-shaft in the growth plate and then over a period of time looked at how much the proximal end of the bone had grown and how much the distal end of the bone had grown. And what they discovered was that the proximal end of the bone grows twice as fast as the distal end of the bone. And measurements have been made by a number of investigators showing that the proximal growth plate is twice as thick as the uh, distal growth plate. And therefore, the speculation has been, not just speculation, but anatomical evidence has been that these proximal growth plates are very susceptible to mechanical damage and trauma because they're thicker and they're growing faster. So how does this relate to bacterial infection of the proximal ends of these leg bones? Um, if we're very careful to dissect out bones and uh, very careful not to twist or torque the bones while we're collecting them and preserving them, in some birds, this happens to be a day 30 or 35 uh, broiler, we can see these microfractures and clefts forming. And these are basically tears between the adjacent layers of cartilage. You can see the white cap of articular cartilage here and the epiphysis, or uh, uh, physicist rather, the growth plate here. And then between the cartilage columns, you can see these tears and clefts. Uh, this is fairly common. Lots of people are discovering that this is routine uh, in the growth plates of both turkeys and uh, broilers. And at a higher magnification, you can see how that tends to dissect the white cap of cartilage away from the growth plate. Here's the growth plate here. And if it transects these blood vessels, which are penetrating downward, or the blood vessels that are penetrating upward, that kills the cells in that particular area. It creates a zone of necrosis, which favors bacterial infection. If this area is not infected by bacteria, no harm, no foul. The bone continues to grow. That's absorbed into the marrow of the bone and basically the bird doesn't seem to uh, be bothered by all of this. But um, what's clearly going on is we're creating niches uh, which are available for opportunistic bacteria to colonize, and clearly we're creating a situation where it's favorable for the white cap of articular cartilage to separate from the top of the growth plate. And we see this fairly routinely now in, in modern broilers that are growing rapidly. This is called femoral head separation. But to get to this point, you have to have created a very broad cleft between the, uh, the boundary there. So what we're looking at then is an opportunity for bacterial infection in these uh, microfractures and clefts. And the final piece of the puzzle is that these blood vessels that are following the growth plate from below are fenestrated. They have large gaps in their endothelial walls. And so any bacteria that break into the circulation can leak out through those fenestrations right there at the base of the growth plate. The bacteria can colonize these uh, uh, clefts and voids. And basically what you end up with is a nice uh, bacterial colony here. You see bacterial colonization of the growth plate. Uh, the bacteria tend to secrete a biofilm, which protects them from the immune system and antibiotics. And also, as the growth plate elongates, the blood vessels supporting this underneath are damaged. And without that support structure of trabecular bone, uh, the growth plate is more subject to microfracturing and colonization. So basically, these are the mechanisms that we believe are involved in the pathogenesis of, of this uh, uh, bacterial uh, colonization. Uh, the question remains, how do bacteria enter the bloodstream to colonize these microfractures? And um, uh, how can we get at that experimentally? 
Uh, various people have published bacteria that they're isolating. Uh, basically, what you see here is a list of Staphylococcus, Enterococcus species. Commonly, we see Staphylococcus aureus. Commonly, we see Enterococcus secorum uh, in the long bones of the legs and also in the T4 vertebrae. We've also seen E. coli and Salmonella and Streptococci. I won't go into it, but basically using modern genomic analysis with one of our collaborators at the Poultry Center, we can find dozens of bacterial species present in, in these growth plates. And the bottom line is that it looks like uh, bacteria uh, in the bird's environment are commonly leaking into the bloodstream and being deposited at the growth plates. So they're heavily colonized by bacteria. So we can put that together in this model. Um, basically, we have a rapidly growing bone. We have blood vessels supplying and supporting the growth plate. Uh, we have fast growth. Of a thick growth plate creates the opportunity for mechanical damage, which is called osteochondrosis, which does apparently no damage to the bird, no clinical damage to the bird, unless we get bacteria into the circulation. We know for sure that bacteria can penetrate the epithelium of the respiratory tract, and in our work, we've focused on in, uh, bacterial translocation across the epithelium of the intestine, particularly in response to stress. Once bacteria cross the epithelium, they can enter the arterial circulation, and particularly if we have immunosuppression, we can isolate these bacteria from the bloodstream. They flow in the circulation, and exit the capillaries at these osteochondrotic microfractures and clefts and create lameness. So this is the basic pathogenesis model. And by the way, this is the mechanism that uh, juvenile humans get hematogenous osteomyelitis as well. So this is not particularly uh, new or novel for poultry. So to test this model, um, we focused on the intestinal integrity and health as a possible route of bacterial translocation. And uh, we also focused on creating a mechanical model to create additional stress and microfracturing here. And then we focused on the intestinal epithelium. So let's take a look at this mechanical model. Uh, this is basically a 24-pin arrangement in our research facility. And what you're looking at is 10 by 10 foot pins. This one has wire flooring, flat wire flooring. And basically this creates footing instability in the bird. Uh, we create stress by giving them bright 23 hours of light a day. Feed with no animal byproducts. We don't want to purposefully expose them to pathogens. Thermoneutral temperatures, excellent ventilations, no vaccinations. Then heavy culling on day 14 to get rid of the hatchery trash. Lots of birds are showing up out of hatcheries with bacterial infections, and we want to start this experiment with clinically healthy birds. Um, it turns out that this model also creates physiological stress. These birds have high uh, blood levels of stress hormones and high heterophyll to lymphocyte ratios, so the lack of abscess to litter creates physiological stress. Boy, I'm really late, huh? So basically, we can look through this. Let's go to the, we, we can show differences in genetic lines. We can show our mechanical model works. Um, and let me talk about this in the final three or four minutes here. Uh, basically, looking at the intestinal integrity, um, again, looking at the tight junctions, one of the key features of probiotics is that probiotics can stimulate the tight junctions to tighten up and they can stimulate gene expression of tight junction proteins. So we believe that probiotics are very useful in that regard. And in response to stress, we have an opening up of these tight junctions that allows the bacteria to translocate through the paracellular route, enter the bloodstream, create a bacteremic situation, and infect these leg bones. So can we demonstrate that bacterial translocation? Yes, we can. Uh, we've taken Staphylococcus and Enterococcus, added it to the drinking water, typically in day seven chicks, on flat wire flooring to create the mechanical stress and the physiological stress. And the results are that birds from a resistant line on that wire flooring, we got a 10% incidence of lameness with just regular drinking water. Birds exposed at day seven 
developed lameness beginning at day 30 with staphylococcus. The enterococcus was not successful. And again, the staphylococcus and enterococcus worked well. So clearly, these bacteria are coming in through the drinking water. They're passing across the gut uh, wall. And they're traveling to the bones that are being challenged on this wire flooring model and creating lameness. Um, this does not work if the birds are on just litter flooring. So we need the stress of the wire flooring to do it. And clearly, we can demonstrate bacterial translocation. Can we impact this with probiotics? So we can grow chicks in these environmental chambers with litter flooring and control feed, or on wire flooring with control feed or feed containing probiotics. And this is basically a test model for the efficacy of probiotics to prevent bacterial translocation. Uh, ideal conditions for showing that. And the answer is, in this experiment with the Biomin Probiotic Poultry Star, uh, the birds on the five, uh, four different genetic lines, C, B, B, D, and G, low incidence of lameness on, on litter and control feed, high incidence of lameness always on wire flooring uh, with uh, uh, control feed, and then by adding the Poultry Star, we either cut the incidence in half or reduced it back down to control levels, depending upon the genetic line. Um, we've continued that with other probiotics. This is a summary of that poultry star experiment, routinely reducing the incidence of lameness with poultry star, presumably by improving gut health. Uh, this probiotic did not work. Here's another probiotic that did work. And by comparison, this is enrofloxacin treatment. And this paper will be published soon in Poultry Science, but basically what we're seeing is that these probiotics are as effective as enrofloxacin in treating or preventing uh, this, this cause of lameness. So probiotics can provide effective alternatives to antibiotics for reducing lameness attributable, attributable to bacterial translocation across the intestinal epithelium. And these are just uh, examples of the different bacteria or, or uh, that are in these probiotics. So here's our model again. We've basically confirmed every aspect of this model. We're very happy with it. And uh, a concluding statement would be that in an antibiotic-free environment, there are no magic bullets. But certainly, in the next decade, there'll be plenty of opportunities to look at uh, other promoters of gut health and gut integrity. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Yes, yeah, so we will get the question uh, right after.